I know that part. <laughs> we're supposed to be talking how actors develop their characters, but I think we're going to be talking about a couple of actors who are characters. <laughs> um, the idea I had, and this was on the fly, because like I say, we're kind of uh, still under construction here because of some setbacks that we've had. The program book is going to be ready pretty soon, so we'll have that for you. We'll have some more panel ideas for later on. Later on tonight, we're going to keep things going on an impromptu basis. I'm going to be basically teaching a course in Fandom 101 about some things that organized fandoms tend to have as part of their culture. I'm um, also going to have maybe a room party. We're going to have to have some things like maybe a collating party and packet stuffing party. So we're going to just have some real close get-togethers. Um, right now, the idea for this panel is that scripts generally do not contain any hints about a character's history or personality or, or any of that type of thing. It's just merely the words and the dialogue. The actor has to put into the work his own ideas of what this kind of character would be. Now, I think... Um, Cam Fong had some clues, probably, because he had been a police officer for about 18 years, so he had that pretty well covered. Uh, so we want to go ahead and just ask them to open up and say if they had any ideas, or, of course, he gave me a real simple answer that took about two seconds to spout out, which is going to leave us with about 45 minutes of uh, discussion. <laughs> yes, okay. So come on. <laughs> what what did you what did you think about Chin Ho Kelly? How did you become Chin Ho Kelly? I think it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Put him on the spot. But really, you know, seriously, it's nice being here, nice meeting all you nice people here. You all want to be actors, really serious, you want to be actors? Hmm? Well, like they're running for office. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a quote here. And this is from Shakespeare. It says that all the world's a stage, and all men are merely players, and one man in his lifetime plays many parts. And in the essence, all of you are actors. Really. I'll say in English. She's an actress. <laughs> <laughs> She's playing a part of Karen. I played a part of Cam Ford. What's your name? Tammy. Huh? Tammy. Tammy, beautiful name. You play the role of Tammy. Did you know that? Every day you're an actor. You're an actress. You're acting. You're acting. We're all players. Then one day. But really, I think uh, it's really not that hard. Uh, I think that uh, you get the script, you study the script. If you're going to play the part of Tammy, you must know the storyline. And once you get the storyline, what is Tammy? You know, what's her problem? Your unhappy housewife, then you watch somebody else. And you get out of that's why, you know, angry, you angry. And I think one of the, uh, I found for myself personally that I was always active as a youngster in dramatics in school. And I've taken up dramatics. But I found that one of the easiest things to do if you wanted to learn to be yeah, an actor uh, is to watch people. Did you know that? See? If you, you watch, if you was afraid of part of an old man, go down the street and watch an old man. You know what I mean? So you watch a old man, I'm going to take old man so the old man looks like this. <laughs> uh, and you watch it, then you just imitate it, right? Not too <laughs> <laughs> So if you're playing a truck driver, watch a truck driver. Every day in your life, you're on the street, you know, you play a part of a city square, the supermarket, if you check in the groceries, watch it. Watch the reaction on the clerk. Is that what I mean? So I'm okay. This is the man. I'm a supermarket clerk. And this is what he does. I did the same thing. I saw the I'm going to put you on the spot because your career mostly was as a comedian. And a singer. And a singer. Then you, he can't sing anymore. <laughs> then, then you found yourself cast in a dramatic part. And I have to say that I think there were several uh, instances where you showed some tremendous dramatic command. You really impressed me. Only so. one scene. In the <laughs> years I worked with Bible, and they let me smile. <laughs> and I did for a while if I was a earthquake. <laughs> my face cracked. <laughs> Jack didn't let us smile. We were going to tell jokes. And he knew all the comedian. So I had to just say, hold back. 
back and really act the part. <laughs> but, you know, for us, it uh, became a lot easier because one thing that is done in the islands, and the island culture is what we were born and raised with. So you had a natural inherent talent or culture in the back of you. And when you took the job, you were looking for, you found in the casting of each individual, myself and Cam. That's where the characters were established. Um, as far as the script goes, there's just words, there's just dialogue to be said. But if you want to do, uh, the best way to put it was you get five guys and you say, okay, each one of them gonna give you the ticket. It's the book, your cop, you just pull the car over and you go up to the car and you write a ticket, how do you do it? One guy pulls up, he looks at the front, he writes. Next guy puts his boot on the Put you know on a bumper, aggravates the driver, he's walking down it, writes it, smiles at him. The next guy comes by, roll the window down, you know, and stick his face in him. Everybody's had their own character, so that's what we did. We showed our character at the reading, and he, he just got to pick. So the scene we used, my scene was uh, he made a mistake. Yeah, my scene involved eating a sandwich. Very first show, that was wrong. Anytime you're gonna have an agency, uh, I saw some through the years, and you remember that movie Tom Jones uh, with uh, Albert Finney? Did nothing. You have to do it. You just see an agency when you get a Hawaiian at lunch, not hungry, just at lunch period. You show you how to eat. So when I walked in um, for casting, I was to grab the sandwich off my garage desk and said, you know, with a second thought, I said, may I? On the way, I was already gulping it down before I got permission. And I said, oh, sh over there. And before I could say it, I turned around, I just checked out the whole thing. Well, I walked in with the script, and I had a hit, uh, can of pull, pull under my script. So I walked in, and I made believe it was a sound, and it was a whole motion, you know. Oh, how eating seems to is natural. And I just chucked out the whole can and poke, almost exploded. <laughs> and it said, you know, all the time we were doing that, and, and yeah, that's, that's what really sold it because it was the character, the person, and uh, being in show business, uh, stage entertainer, which is live, you're much more open to the audience, and you know how to play it up. You know, you really, you know, you can emote, and you have no problem controlling your facilities. So I, I felt that I went in there, I just did what I did naturally. And it took all through my career. It wasn't acting. It was your natural ability, they found in you, and you give you the script, and you just put the two together, and you became that person. Of course, Lenny Freeman's creative eye was still looking for a special mold of character, a special Hawaiian in a way, when you look at my part, from Kalakawa. Kalakawa is the name of a famous street in Haiti called the Hopers Go. And uh, it's also named to Hawaiian Wildy because uh, I was supposed to be related in a generation back to the royal family. So this is why it gave me an element of a link to the past and the present. And all the he wanted a BP, you know, stocky kind of guy, like almost like a gorilla mentality. You know, no brains. And this the guy was a sick of bundle. Um, that bomb would unleash my powers. <laughs> and I would shoot him up. And we, we, we did little scenes like that. Um, we did a scene once where we drove up at 100 miles an hour in a space of 30 yards, come to a space of ball, runs with it, on the door, and it's open up. One second, they give you a open up. They looked at me, Kono. And I would run through and break this door. It was an old warehouse, and it was a real door, everything. And when he said, oh, I ran through, I broke the door, and the whole part of that door fell out of the building. Um, it all crashed in. And right when we did that, you know, then he had a loud screaming inside. And he said, You son of a bitch, you fuck up, please. Remember that? It was the owner of the building. And I actually demolished the door, and it wasn't in the, the, the special props and not set up the door to collapse. It was a real door that I put on and broke it off the wall. And, <laughs> <laughs> and when Jack found out, he went, wasn't that little really? 
He did not. You know what he means? Well, I'll take my rug or anything. <laughs> <laughs> For once, he, he just was, oh, gotta check this guy out, man. <laughs> it was funny, so I just had to do but my character just to follow through. And I thought it was already set up. But after that, you learn. You check your prop every scene. Then you come very, the longer you go into business, the more technical you get involved. You learn the fine, fine points for what you have to do in every scene is every step, every um, every look, and how to relate one scene going out to the next one and coming into the next video. After a while, you really get involved in your character. You try to be up the producer along or the writer. And then people. But um, for our part, we had a lot of fun. A lot of fun with it. And um, it wasn't really a, none of us went to work. There was no such thing as a dramatic school in Hawaii. You got that on the street, in the clubs. We had no comedian, comedy clubs that I grew up. I was too young to work in the Prolist years. But I still became a comedian. I had to live and die every night on stage. So it was a good experience when Bible came along. It was a fantastic opportunity. And that's how we got into it. You booked us for what we were. Now, both of you have had experience with live audiences. You've done this uh, well, I've community done, theater. I've, I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, stage show in Hawaii. That was my background. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it as a hobby. And uh, I did shows with Haru Community Theater, for the theater for you, and the Chinese dramatic director. Uh, and then I was, I was in radio, you know, and I had a nightclub show like Sulu. And uh, I got in here. And uh, I think the people here are probably most interested in the fact that um, acting on stage and acting for camera is that's what I wanted to get Exactly. Now you got to remember, and I had this problem that uh, when I was performing on stage, I had to uh, use big gestures on stage because you know it's a big auditorium, sitting 500 people. I must project my voice so that the guy in the last row can hear me. See? And that was my background. And then, of course, I used to do a little bit, uh, bit parts here when the movies came, but no, back, no training in acting before camera. Now, this really happened to me because when we did 5 0, I had no real background in acting before camera. And with uh, Paul Wenkos, who was the original director, decided that this show. Uh, saw me perform to the camera and Wenkus called me on the side and he says, Cam, remember this, you are no longer on stage, no longer big gestures, no longer projecting your voice. If this camera the lens is looking right at you. And so what it is, if you act before camera, I always remember this now, is that uh, you emote with your eyes. See? The camera is in front of you and it's your eyes and it's not yet yet. yet, yet. And, as, and, and you know, you've got to be very careful that you don't use gestures because flick, you ruin the scene. Of it, you know? So I would suggest that if you're acting, uh, people will go for commercial and stuff, but always remember that you're in front of camera. And if it's a close shot, then you have to remember that you remote with your eyes. I can look at you and you're talking to me, and I'm listening to you, and uh, I would not say, I would just, you know. Almost same. Very close. Mark, did you have a question? Did you have a question? I was going to have a question. Uh, I was just, uh, my main question was uh, to both of these gentlemen. Any uh, any particular episode you favorite? Well, I think I would favor the one that I was involved in. I mean, featuring <laughs> me. Is that I think I, mean, I think uh, Lenny wanted to do to. to Featured me in quite a bit of the shows, but I think Jack kind of frowned upon it. Uh, but I did one called My Lie, when involved my family, uh, and I was accused of taking a bribe, you know, and stuff like that. And then the other one that I enjoy and I like very much was one with Eric Estrada. When he fell in love with my yeah. daughter, yes. yeah. and then he got killed on the island. I remember he shot him at the end, he to kill my daughter. That I enjoyed very much. Yeah. Well, my favorites were in different categories. There was one show we did with the legendary Hilo Hattie, the real name was Andy Clara Ginger. And uh, 
she did a show with us called One Day We Will Be Strangers in Our Own Land. And it related to a very touchy subject today, which is called Sovereignty, the movement of Hawaiian China seeking their own independence and tell the story of how we were overthrown illegally by the United States government. When in fact, we had a king and queen, we were this uh, secret entity, all to our own, recognized by the United Nations. And we did a show like that, it was about developer coming in, taking all the good land and developing this pack of box housing and this for a quick buck and then we finished that and they left the island. So that was a good story and then we did some things that uh, I found very interesting. We did one where it was a typical murder mystery where they couldn't figure out how, you know, who is a who done it situation. And it was very interesting because based on true facts, there's a shell uh, uh, called the cloth of gold in um, uh, Latin is called Tonus Tectilinius and this shell is just round as a night hooking shell you can pick it up, it's elongated and if you hold it on the side you put the point right to a person's skin the proboscis or the, the dot like thing, it comes out and it inserts a poison into your one pore and that alone shut down the breathing apparatus in your nervous system so it was just fascinating to know that this stuff is actually out there. If you look someone upon it in the, you know, the reef, you walk and you kick it, you're a goner. And they'll never figure out, but you know, we gotta always find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's Kona who notices the crucial fact because he sees the dead fish. Well, that's why it was really uh, interesting, you know, the fact that they see, uh, I thought it was a situation that was strictly Hollywood, but when I checked on it, I, I found it, it got my curiosity, so I checked with the, the University of Hawaii and uh, Sea Life Park, and they told me in fact, and I got the books, and I found it so fascinating that, like, oh, here we go, I can find a perfect murder weapon. <laughs> you know, the ultimate word, no trace of nothing. And this thing almost has, you, you can do it murder with this, and you could not find it. Even on the scoop is good. The only thing is the fact that if the scientific uh, data that they find out if they do the autopsy on you shows that one part of your system shut down, then that's not the that's being of the trail to the end. Let's go back to the fascinating. Okay. Let's go back to the difference between stage and, and television. What how how did you adjust to that? Was there any difficulty? Oh yeah, they, <laughs> <laughs> I control the negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> On TV, when you first started, you just like a new guy. Like how Cam said, you work as a hobby, you work as an entertainer. I work for great. <laughs> but uh, I had a nice uh, Hawaiian manager named Roy B. Roy B. Oh, yeah. My Jewish manager, he was a wonderful man. You know. He taught me, he said, the day you work for that, you work for peanuts. And I didn't like peanuts, so. But you, uh, as you go along in the business, uh, you either, like I say, learn or burn. You either get good or get out. When I say, uh, the word was get in line, get out of front, get out of my way. Because you do, you do pick up all the little intricacies. Uh, the camera, for instance, when you, when you first start working on pictures, it's just uh, an object, no problem. As you learn to find points of uh, acting and the different techniques, you find out that if you don't handle it right, the camera can turn into a tiger. And when you mean the tiger is going to either gobble you up or you know how to neutralize it. You can use it to your advantage, but you have a tiger behind you as your friend, and if you do it right, the bully can utility into a nice little I'm your fingers. Does anybody know? I'm not telling people, but acting on camera and being in television, or even in the movies, especially in television, uh, is hard work, really. And if you get past the glamour, you know, at the beginning, once you get past the glamour of of television work, it's a a tiring job, It's it's a very hard job. You have no time to yourself. We spend 12 hours a day on the set, you know, and I would do a scene and I'd go home and tell my family as we watch Firebolt. So you see this particular scene on screen, 
on the uh, TV, it will run maybe say for 25 seconds, not even a minute. But you know to get that 25 seconds of footage will take us maybe two and a half hours. We, now here we are sitting down here, the three of us, right? The camera is here, she has dialogue, I have dialogue, he has dialogue. See? Now if we roll in this camera, and it's just a very short scene now, but it take us say two and a half hours later before we finish this. It's because now it's what we, what we call is a food shot. See? The camera pulls back, it shows the three of us here. See? And you notice they have various cuts. You see one time there's three of us, and suddenly you see only Karen's head. The next time, show three again, and next time, and the, the next scene, which is a shot of me, or next time the shot of Zulu. But it's all the same scene. And that's why it takes a long time. And the trouble is, three of us are saying dialogues that we make, make one take, I will flop my lines. That happens all the time, you know what I mean? I'll get my lines letter perfect. So you get her lines letter perfect. This dumb Hawaiian the blue, the screwed whole thing up because you know, so the direct the screen cut, 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 got to do it over again. See? All right, so I light up again, the sound, you know, got the boom man is over here, and the guy's inspired, camera's rolling, action, and then we start all over again, see, doing the same scene, right? Now, I will say, but we maybe take us 15, 20, half hour. We finally cut this one scene now. Now we have what we call the various cuts. And that's the hardest. See, now there was three of us. Now the camera is only on my character. See, as what they call a close headshot. But because the three of us in the same scene, I have to feed her the lines and dialogue so she can react to what I'm telling her. But we're off camera now. See, the camera's only focusing on her. Zool is on one side, I want to put the camera, we get close to her, we can feed her the lines so that as she can react to me, you know, react to us. See? And, and the worst thing that can happen to me or anybody in Zool is to have uh, a stand in or somebody trying to feed me a line. You know, because we always want to have the real say, camera speed, camera speed, and uh, playing the part with me and feeding me her lines. I can react with her because she just, she can emote her, she feeds a line, and I can react to her line. What happens is sometimes they have a stand in and, you know, just read the script. Uh, how are you can from today? Where are you going to the store? You know, you know what I mean? So there's a different reaction, you know, because now it's on me, it's, it's a reaction. My face, only my face is on the screen, and that's very important to me, you know. So I would like to have Karen feed me the lines. So if I was talking to Karen, and uh, if I did a scene, I says, you know, darling, I love you, I love you really, you know what I mean? You see, every reaction is different. Now, if you get somebody come here and say, Karen, I love you, I love you. <laughs> you see, it's very difficult, you know. So, that's why I said to, to do, maybe, like I said, 25 seconds, one minute, which, you know, running time on screen, it takes two, three, four hours. And it's boring, and we, we repeat and repeat that goes. So after we get past the glamour of being on television, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's really, I would say, it's a very difficult job. The pay is good. <laughs> you know, being a celebrity, I guess it's wonderful. Like, being invited into the Burbank. If you was in the fire she wouldn't even fight me. For a reason, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it has its compensation. But it is a very difficult uh, job. So, do you want it good? If not, uh, it's not, it's really not that easy. You have a script, you got to read the script. Every night you read the script. You have so many pages to study, they're going to do six pages tomorrow, scenes 41, scenes 58, and scene 60. And you see the trouble with television is that they don't run it in sequence, see? Now, if I'm on stage, I can work myself up to this character and do my emotional thing that I'm supposed to cause the stage, but, you know, you have act one, act two, right, like that. Television doesn't do that. You get the whole script, you know, but the first day of shoot might be the ending of the show. You see, you never follow sequence to build up the character. So you must be immediately ready to emote whatever it's supposed to be, see? So the first day of shooting might be the scene where I lost her. See? Now you read, I gotta get this, you know, where I, I lost, I lost Karen, you know what I mean? He died. What I'm gonna do? And so, you, so immediately you gotta be able to do, do this now. And, or maybe the next scene is something entirely different, you see? Now this is the one you left with. And he came, 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 and he came,
there's no continuity of your character. You must know your character, but you know it's not that easy. <coughs> Whereas in, I find it's easier for me to act on stage because I can work my character from the first scene, first act, and second act, you know, and then the third act. So, so you build yourself up, there's no problem. But on television, it doesn't work that way. So, so you take ending, opening, middle, you don't know, you know what I mean? And I think the worst thing that can happen is you study all night, learning your lines, and suddenly if something happens, you may have to be shooting outdoors. And then suddenly it's starting to rain, it's clouding up, you can't do shooting outdoors. So let's go indoors to the sound stage. So everybody go back in the sound stage, camp, we're going to do this scene, do this scene. <laughs> now it's the interior in the office with my character. I've got to sit down, start studying the line, and now it's something entirely different. So you've got to study my lines and do this scene. So these are something that's unexpected at times that you have to be you know, able to cope with them. That when suddenly you're going to you prepare yourself with this scene, and suddenly it's another scene that you're going to do right now. So it's very hard. It's not easy, really. I don't know about so you used to sleep on the sound stage all the time. Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> Tell me what happened to you, Sue. One day, Jack, Jack is very, very, very happy. You know, I mean, he was doing something that sounds like a very serious scene, you know, and there's this old set sitting inside, you know, and Zuba, he was laying down sleeping in the back, you know, and the off camera was laying down sleeping. And then the camera was rolling genius, and Jack is doing his scene, and, and the jeans back up on the side. <laughs> said, what, what is this, you know? It's, it's quiet, you know, I mean, the camera's rolling, it's actually tape now. And, you know, and uh, cut. And I look at the Zulu sleeping. <laughs> but Zulu, what was the Zulu snoring? Was Jimmy snoring? You know, he was just he went to trouble. <laughs> Some of the things we did to each other on stage, we did laugh. Like. <laughs> there one time, more time. Yeah, yeah. One other time. People had yeah. this scene, then someone would walk by and said, uh, "I'm giving five dollars to get to the one scene," and then he would break into a nervous breakdown. <laughs> we just all go to pieces. Yeah, what they do, they get together, you know, this, especially they, they know that Jack is a very, you know, hot taskmaster. So I have a scene with Jack, so it's a two scene, they call two scene, it's not as Jack and I and the camera's on, and they're going to roll this film. So Jim Lee and they all get together and say, can't you find out a cat with a blues line? So out of the corner of my eyes, I can see all this, you know, because they're behind the camera, see, but... <laughs> so they're all taking bets, you know, that I'm going to roll a line with Jack and, you know, but if you blow your mind with Jack, you're in trouble, you know. Jesus Christ, what the hell would you study this guy? We used to just stand there off, off set, yeah. away from the light, and just looking at him with straight faces. <laughs> Terrorizing. Jimmy and I would just stand there. <laughs> Oh, you didn't pull that smoke. Yes. Oh, so no, we had, but we, we had a lot of fun, uh, you know, on the set. I mean, it was Jimmy, myself, and Dick Sue, and the, the local cast. Uh, we had a lot of fun. That's why I can't don't have too much of a butt. <laughs> 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 Jack too bolts of it off. <laughs> and the more, once Jack gets angry and scolded, then his three word line, one line, three words, is to really shock. <laughs> it's like, take 15. <laughs> now, when Jack blows his line, he says, yeah, so end Marcus, you know, we just put his hand at the end and watch everybody together. But when we blow our line, uh, take six, and we can take 14. <laughs> and somebody goes, 14! <coughs> there he goes. But uh, there was no, no mercy show. <laughs> Well, a lot of you people maybe one day will probably act before camera. And another thing is that you must remember is to how to find your marks. What is so mark is that we do a scene like this. Yeah? So they set the camera. The cameraman wants to shot this way. I want this. The camera standing there. So who's there? Jim is there. So what they do is, okay, line them up. And, but we have the standing doing that scene. We know this will relax the sense there. But what happened is, so I'm here. What they do is they put up like that on the floor, right? This is my mark. So I will come into the scene, and I come out of here, but I, I must hit this spot. If I don't hit that spot, I'm out of focus. See? Now, what happens is a lot of the people that don't know that, uh, you know, that means... maybe, you know, the thing on the camera for <laughs> is you do this, you come like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then, 
<gasps> cut, cut, you know, and Derek would scream out when his people cut. What the hell are you doing? Jesus Christ, don't look for that man. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's really hard to say, you know, you find this mark. Well, you got to put a sandbag to find your mark. It's yeah. really embarrassing. You know, they put a hat hat on it, a hat box, walk in, so then we kick the box and make a lot of noise, and Jack goes off. But it was, the whole thing added up to one word discipline. That's the word discipline. You always have to have discipline. You guys can't say it. You do it in different scenes, requires different, uh, different uh, you know, emotions at different times. And then you have to be ready to just change the gears. And that's where the word thespian comes in. That's why some of the, the great actors. What did he say? Thespian? <laughs> always. No. Zero. Tespian, what did you get that word for? Lesbian. Oh, Lesbian? <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Tespian. What is a Tespian? How the hell did you get on television? Let me reiterate my statement. Oh, reiterate. Oh, no. Oh, reiterate. Oh, reiterate. <laughs> <laughs> what was that about? What you using? What was that I said, yes, sure, I love you, too. Look at that, too. Hook up. You know, making this, uh, <laughs> making this show, each individual program was a life in itself. The day you show up for shooting, the first day of shooting, you said, the baby being born. You want to come on, you have a fresh, happy production meeting, you wrap one show, and you have your script already, you said, happy production meeting. So we all see you tomorrow, see at 6.30 a.m., Everybody there fresh and bright. So a new show coming up and the new actors coming in from Hollywood to change and new action. So it's like your mom is a new life again. And the show takes on a life of its own and you go through the good times, bad times, ups and downs, the emotional highs and lows. And at the end, when the show is finished, you know, the final day, and everybody is walking a little slower, no matter what the show is. Psychologically, it's coming to an end. And once you get to and you're ready for the word, it's in the can. So when you're doing that last year, uh, every so often it'll be set up so that the crew can be there, the home set will be called to the office, and we just all get in there and shoot the set regardless of where it is in the script. And when finally you hear the word is, I'm going to have to sound good, and the word is, I do it, it's a wrap. And that's it, it's like the end, it's like you die. Into the so that's what it's like. And as you come to work each day, you have to, well, you learn that the camera could be a tiger, could devour you, or could be friendly. So you learn to discipline yourself to separate each movement and the scenes. And when you write the script, you, I mean, you get your script, and the other side is blank. I always wonder why I had one big blank opposite page. Well, you have to write the emotions and everything on it where your cues just to be mentally sharp and regardless of what you think back here in Hollywood when they get the most crucial person in the editing person they sit out there and you write your letters and you're doing good work and you get kudos they sit to you and you really feel that you're learning your trade you're learning your craft and you're learning the discipline you have to put your heart into it, put your mind into it, and then you separate the thing you get to cut and it. Now the bad thing about it is some people they live that life you know, after the, the word rap is given and they go home, they think they are the characters. You know, and they start bullying themselves around town and later on you find out you go upside down in the wrong way. You find out you're just not a human being. Emotions, but you know how to channel your own better efforts becomes a separate you from the ordinary person. That's what makes you good. But it's gratifying though when you see that you've done what the producer is trying to do and you hear that you know, tap on the shoulder. And the, does anybody know the difference the uh, how far it is between? 
success and failure. Not the fact that I'm taking a but basically what it is.
because they, they didn't have more experience before Camel. They were sticking, you know, with the lock time, and the cup was losing money, wasting you know. So they probably had to bring a lot of big guys from Hollywood. Or if you notice in Five Wall, you notice that uh, the experienced act, local actor would be in four, five, six, seven episodes with the same guy. One show he was playing the, the taxi driver. The next show is one of the heaviest. The following week, he was another part. You know, so you probably know he's recognized a lot of guys. Uh, you know, local people in White Five Wall was playing different characters. So I just saw him last week. He was a district attorney. This show now is a cab driver. <laughs> but because they were forced to use these people because they had the background and the knowledge to save the company money. Well, it was fun is when they had dead body one week and, week and the next week they resurrected and so on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. does, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Chip. I have no idea how to ask this. So try to figure out what the question is and all this. There, there were a lot of things that made wife I go what it was. Can they capture that again in a movie? Can they do it? I doubt it. I mean, it's, it was the time period and it was the, the way they filmed and the location and a place where no one had ever gone and never got that much press. Well, I'll show it was, uh, it was the right time, the right place, yeah. the right yeah. the right script. Everything just fell in. And the right people. Yeah. yeah. It just so has the chemistry was there. It was. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think you could do it again with work. I think you see that part of it that doesn't necessarily have to be in television, but in real life, you know, looking for a job or something like that. But it's just that it was everything was just falling in line, it was perfect. And you cannot do it with that. And if it was supposed to revive it, I thought it would have been success again because the characters, if they had somebody playing my role again or playing his role, it won't be the same. You see? And when I wanted to leave the show in the 10th season, uh, I think I. I felt highly honored because you know they, they, this is well. Let's kill him off. Remember that, that my last scene, they killed me off, and I, I refused. And I refused to do the last exercise. No, I don't want to be killed off. I wanted to retire gracefully. You know, I'm going to retire from five O, and I want to spend time with my wife and my family, and that was it. No, strictly the back that they they want to have Chino jumped off, and I fought it. And then the telephone calls back and forth, and then finally, you know, they were going to try to sue me if I didn't finish my contract. Then a <clears throat> guy gave me good advice, and I said, you know, Pam, I was in Hollywood, and he told me, you should be in an honor if you are regular in a television series, and they knock you off. That's an honor. Because they feel, Hollywood feel, that's what the Producer Hollywood told me because they can, they, they felt that nobody can play the role of Chino. You see, so when they knocked me off, nobody played Chino. That character was finished out, a good finish. You see? And that's what happened, and that, that is normal. In Hollywood, if you play the character, nobody can play the role again. You see, that was it. Did you come back the next week as a waiter? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just relax and have fun. I come up to Hollywood. But of course, you know, being a regular in the television series doesn't help me at all. You see, I'm typecast. And uh, I've been to Hollywood for interviews and stuff like that. I've been to all the studios and stuff like that. But you're big on your teeth. You know what they tell me? Because everybody recognizes my face, and all they can think about me is Chino, 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 and I can't knock that image out. So if I was to play, you know, big part in this show and that show, it would work for me. So they said the only way I could work for Hollywood was that they, they featured me, uh, you know, as a second uh, uh, lead, you know what I mean? That the other guest star, you know, and I'm playing this particular role. And it has to be a big role. So I can't come on and play big parts anymore because I'm too established. So that's kind of like ruining your career. And I was just telling my son, I think Eric Estrada and the others have the same problem today because any uh, actor that's been on the television series for a long time, they feel like a magnet, he's having trouble with Tom Selleck, you know? Because if you see Tom Selleck, you already remember Magnum. You see me on, a, on another show, oh, that's a guy that's in your fan role, you see? The face is recognizable, so he kills your career, really, in a sense, yeah. So when you're making money on television, you save your money. They are in all the work that's that catch, whatever you do. And 
after the picture was over, I went to a reading, British Europe was filming in Hawaii. And they said I was too, too fair looking. <laughs> Those people done in the Caribbean, I wasn't black enough. This is what the producers told me. I went to the next picture that came to town and said I'm too dark, karate kid. They're looking for Oriental, you know. So, either way, right at home, <laughs> you get the same thing you get here in Hollywood, but we're living it because the, we only get to accept whatever companies come to town. Uh, unless you want to, let say, go to Harvard and go stateside, come up here in LA. But you know, when you get about it, this give you a bad rap race, and <laughs> the odds. You just got to be honored with yourself. Odds are on the Polynesian trying to break into the business. What are the type of roles you get to play? It's not that much. But, you know, changing the subject now, once this uh, a subject, part of the subject of making television, working in the business, is that it is like real life. It is a real people. It's like you and I, and in real life, there are good people and there are bad people. And it is seldom very brought, uh, spoken about or brought up in discussion. And I was, um, I'll just say, put in my place many times for shooting my mom off when I was, wasn't supposed to, but in fact, I just tell it the truth. There are a lot of things that say that they're good stars, they're bad stars, and you're about working with different. And it's a thing, it's a fact of reality, it's a life that you have to face, and it does happen, and it does drive people nuts, and you guys do stupid, crazy things, and then sometimes they end up breaking the camera's back, and next thing you know, you're gone. This is what happened to me. But I didn't, if I said anything about it, and was it like by the front office? I said, well, that's proof. No, same question. If I was lying, they let me go. If I was lying, they couldn't find anyone that said I wasn't lying. So in other words, everything I was saying was the truth. And these are some of the things that you have to learn to live with. It was what, what we call in the island, in the rural Hollywood type, you know, face reality. It's uh, a little, I would say that we're different. But uh, the people are more down to earth, and uh, we tend to call the shots like what it is. And that's what happened in my case, and that's why I left the show. And there are good people, there are bad people. Nobody would say anything bad about that law. But uh, you say he was a taskmaster, he was a very professional, and he went through the line. But still, there was a point where it pushed some people's humble too much. Scenario. Because everyone will say, How long were you there? So, the first four or five years there? Four years, about three years, and three or four years. And I would really enjoy myself. I had a good time, and I worked, I was burning the candle at both ends. I worked in a nightclub, I had a big nightclub review, big shows, three shows a night. My last show, I got through at 3 o'clock in the morning. I went home to sleep, I got up, reported the set at 6 30. And they didn't please. It was you know, there were times when you had, but I never snored. <laughs> and when, you want to step at your point. <laughs> so these are some of the things that you know. The, there's a real question that is not often brought about. If you can be a good talent, if you go in there and you're jeopardizing the, the star. And if they feel threatened by you, then the Hollywood game sucks. Does anybody, and it's happened on the Does anybody have any other questions? Right. What have you done since your 5 0 days? What projects are each of you involved in now? Oh, I've done a whole bunch after that. But she's got a reason. There's a the casting, the casting agents in Hawaii known by all of us and they know what we can do and there's 
day with the cats for the other show. There's about three or four cats in '86 in a white area. <clears throat> when they need the part, they're looking for that type. And, you know, when they, when they call us, they know they don't have to talk. They have credentials, they don't have to talk great. Whereas other people, uh, below scale, that's the hard part we have. I worked for 18 years as a member of the screen group. 12 years. My first 12 years as a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And I never had a union hall or union representative to go to. When I first started movies, I was a youngster and I was a big boy with white feet. So we did Diamond Head and uh, Hawaii. And we had one scene with Diamond Head with the point diamond scene. We went down to Honolulu Harbor. And uh, so even without glasses, we could see you when you dive all the time. You know, you, you know how to move. Keep your eyes open. So what we can tell the difference. You know, we know what they call a flash, you know, which is on the side of the belly. And when it's a big flash, you know, and the word goes up. We saw that in the video. Uh, I don't know. It's not no tuna has been happy. So we were working in conditions that was deemed uh, uh, dangerous or hazardous, and we're getting only eleven dollars an hour. So we we got we really got to say screwed over because we didn't have any union. Even until after many years when the Hawaiian came to Hawaii and established. And then even then after we established we were SAG, we still didn't have the true representative. But they found out they were doing things and they were getting away with it. And uh, we never had anybody to complain to. We asked the assistant director about the producers and they would say, well, uh, if it was too rough, we would get somebody else. In other words, you won't work. So you have to just prepare it. Did you make the stage after 5-0 was over with? Do your shows? Yeah, did you do the, the stage shows? When, when you left 5-0, you went well, back to the stage well, I, never, I never left the stage. Uh -huh. I was always doing shows. Uh -huh. When 5-0, when I left the show, I became bigger. Uh -huh. um, then I could use the word Hawaiian star. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Mike. Pam Fong, uh, what kind of a police job did you have? Was it like a beat cop or were you an administrative job? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started as a patrol, patrolman. Uh -huh. And then I took the examination and then they finally became a border patrolman. You know what I mean? They want me to say in Hawaii, a border patrolman. I had no need and I had no need and I had That was it. I had 18 and a half years. Department and, and, and how you I have to go back at the beginning when I became a peace officer because during the war in 1944, uh, I was married at that time, I had a wife, and I said, my daughter, I said, this is, so what happened was that uh, there were two big, uh, two big 25 bombers colliding in, in media in the residential district where I live, and the plane crashed and killed my, my, my wife. My son and my daughter, I lost the entire family. And uh, at that time, I was working at Pearl Harbor. And uh, I didn't want to drive past the, you know, at the highway I had to go through, I had to pass the scene all the time. So I finally talked to the commandant of the yard that I wanted to leave Pearl Harbor and I wanted to, you know, and, uh, and he was having a furlough at that time. And I said, well, under circumstances, I will release you. Uh, but if you want to come back anytime, I'll reinstate you as a as a to the world again. And so after that, uh, I wanted to, to you know, like commit suicide. I was I wanted to die, and I, I could kill this. I mean, I was drunk. And I thought, well, I wanted something to take this out of me. So I thought, well, I joined the police department. And do my wars rough because a serviceman to fight every day. We to fight, you know. And this is what I wanted, not because I wanted to win. I mean, uh, I was disappointed in God, you know. <clears throat> so I, that's how I joined the police department, and I stayed there for 18. And I became a leader in that place. And I swore at that time I would never get married again, you know. And it was five years later, I met my second wife. She was a very beautiful woman. She was Portuguese Hawaiian. And my first wife was Hawaiian Chinese. And uh, that's the result. Was my son right there. That's my first one right there. <laughs>
you actually smoke a pipe in real life? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe this. Now, I mean, I mean, you guys are going to hate me for this, but uh, I've been I'm smoking. I, I, I learned how to smoke a cigar during the war. And uh, later on, after, while I was in the police department, I was training the, what they call the junior police officer, too, right here. You know, police, little kids are standing on the street, old stop signs, so the kids can cross over. And uh, I'd go there, you know, and I'd drill there and, and, you know, talk to the kids. And after that, I'd go to the cafeteria with the teacher. And we'd sit down in the teacher's room or whatever we were there. And uh, we'd drink coffee and we'd chit chat for a while, you know. But uh, they would smoke cigarette and I, I didn't want to light up a cigar because, you know, people would always smoke a sneaky cigar, you know. So I, that's how I started learning how to smoke cigarette. So now, I smoke cigar, I smoke cigarette, and I smoke pipe. He does. <laughs> <laughs> All three at the same time. <laughs> no, I said it's true. I mean, I've been smoking now for what, 50 something more years or more. He does. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. Because people say, well, we go get cancer, you know. Well, My vision was this day. I was done with. Oh. I truly made, I never know anyone to go through so as much tobacco <laughs> and as much variety. <laughs> well, I tell you, I tell you the reason why I'm not. I mean, I, I know it's a bad habit. I know, and like you said, it's true. I do smoke a lot, but I always believe this is my my philosophy of life. Whether you you, you have grown, I have grown. I believe this honestly. I, I believe in the heaven, God. I believe in the Creator, and I believe that the day I was born, my time is set. God said, "Can form you will when I hear you can no more hundred years from now." And from this time until this time, I can be five plane crashes, smoke 50 million cigars, and you know, 10 million packs of cigarettes, uh, nothing's going to happen. But when come that hundred, the day that I have to go, I will eat a piece of meat and choke to death. <laughs> well, I was walking the street in a car, hit me and run me over, you know, something like that. But I, because, you know, I, 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 I have instant I can take back time to, to prove my theory. Uh, you know, about if it's your time, something make you do something you never do. Because I've seen that happen. A good example was that my sister used to work for this, the president of my electric company. And they had a beautiful son who was about nine years old. And uh, there was a Sunday afternoon, bright, beautiful day, and the son was working in the garage doing something, and his friends came over and said, let's go hike up the Sacred Falls. You see, in the back there's a hill there, there's a fall, and they have to hike up the wall, you know. It's and the boy didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. He refused. He wanted to go somewhere. And his father came there and heard the kids, you know, his friend asking to go hiking. And you know what he said to his son? It's a nice day. Put this thing, we'll go hiking. And the son went up. He didn't want to go. He was very reluctant. He went there. And they later on, they heard the sirens in the ambulance. And they said, well, I guess somebody must have fell off the fall. It was his son. So how do you see? Again, that theory about, see, the son didn't want to go. The father came, and the father insisted that he go. Right, that's one incident. There was another time we were sitting down at a street corner, and there was a couple on the boulevard in one room that was very late, it was just recently open, and we were sitting down there about 7.30 at night on a corner in a street gang. I'm not gang, but you know, we're about 15, 31. And a guy came up with an old Ford Oster from the seat type, you know, and he says, come on, let's go for a ride, you know. I didn't want to go, she didn't want to go, he didn't want to go, you know, but then, he said, okay, and they just about starting off, one of our friends crossed the street, perfect timing, you know what I mean? So the guy says, hey, Joe Blow, you want to go for a ride? Yeah, jump in on the seat. The following morning, you read the paper, they get a telephone call. Guess who got killed? The guy in the rumble seat. See, perfect timing now. If he had come just, say, 10 seconds later, right, and they had gone, you know what I'm trying to say? Timing. I can't just say timing. See, we didn't want to go. They were just about to leave when he came on the scene. You, for the right. Yeah. It's your time. Speaking of timing, we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Chip? The question I was going to have is... Do you ever get to the point when you see Hawaii Five-0 coming on television that you can watch it as an episode and not go back to when you filmed that thing and see it as a bunch of 
sort of disproportionate pieces with, oh, I remember when we filmed that and this happened and then this came in. Can you watch it? And well, the way I watch Bible is that I really don't watch it for entertainment for me because, you know, we shot this time. I knew it's all about. I really watched one five oh when I was when, when I was working that time. I would, I would wait and watch for the show to come on because I want to see what I did. Mm -hmm. And when I look at that scene, I says, "Oh, she was stupid!" You know, I, I should have done this way, I could have done it this way. And then that, in a way, it was it was like a learning process for me. You know? So I watched the show. I could be angry, but I didn't do it right.